Um, thank you everyone for coming. This is really exciting and I'm super honored to get to do this as a 16 year old. Um, I just wanted to start off with this quote, which I'm sure many of you may know. It's by Abdul Baha and it says, the happiness of mankind lieth in the unity and the harmony of the human race. And ever since I was a kid, I've always been very attracted to this quote. And I think it really uh, fits in well with what we'll be talking about today. So in my last talk, I spoke about the realization that youth are the harbingers of joy. They, uh, sorry, not of joy, of, of search, of change. They sense it and they have this perfect role to bring it into realization in humanity. So they're at the perfect stage to bring this change. They have the idealism, imagination, unstoppable attitudes of children. They are starting to develop the logical and strategic mindsets of the adults. And they have this heightened ability to be so passionate about a subject that almost nothing can stop them. And then of course, we're in the responsibility sweet spot. I mean, I'm living with my parents, obviously. <laughs> I don't have to uh, financially sustain myself and I don't have a job. So we're in this spot where we are perfectly able to bring change. So I think it's, it's really important to note that the idea of youth, this name, uh, wasn't created until 100 years ago. People had been turning 13 for thousands of years and they only named it after World War I when compulsory high school was created because it created this counterculture outside of the adulthood or of childhood. Um, but the commercial obsession, the stereotyping of teenagers wasn't really created until the 50s. And this was when the baby boomer generation was, was really growing up. But despite that stereotype, they still have always proven themselves to be hungry for change. In every decade, uh, social movements have sprung up and youth have been at the forefront. And now we come to the present after that very brief history. <laughs> and the world has two opposing and completely contradicting mindsets around youth, at least as I've observed. One is that youth are kids, tech obsessed, selfish, party goers, distracted. Uh, and they need to get through their awkward stage as soon as physically possible. And dear God, help anyone who has to be there while they go through that stage. Um, second is that youth are the change and that adults should step out of the way and leave them to change by themselves because they have these capabilities. So the problem with both of these ex um, perspectives is that they each exclude very important insights. The first, this idea that youth are just kids and don't have much to contribute, excludes obviously the potential of the youth. And the second, that adults should step out of their way, excludes the insights and knowledge that adults have uncovered and discovered throughout their years of living. But of course, sadly, the youth-adult relationship has always been strained. I have this quote, which I used as well in my last talk, but I just find it fascinating. It's from 1953. And it's an FBI report published by Edgar Hoover. And he said, the nation can expect an appalling increase in the number of crimes that will be committed by teens in the years ahead. So he uses the two words will be as if there is no chance those crimes won't be committed by youth. Um, and this really made me think, wow, from the very beginning, youth were not able to achieve their higher nature because they weren't being supported by those who are more intelligent um, around them. So being the change really quickly became interpreted as acts of rebellion against your parents. If your parents believe in something, you should stomp on it almost. And that became change, uh, defying your parents. But when we're in conflict with each other and most people know this in other scenarios. It's impossible to get bigger problems fixed. I ask you what's more efficient, youth versus adults versus climate change or us versus climate change. When we're battling, we've been battling two different battles and that's completely ridiculous. 
adults' assumptions also have come to limit youth with phrases like boys will be boys, this is just a phase, uh, what do you know, you're so young, just like that FBI report. So how are youth expected to progress without the support of those with more experience? And it also falls on youth. How can adults help if youth are constantly bashing adults down? I don't know if any of you have heard it, but for COVID-19, as the elderly were being targeted, um, youth were saying boomer remover, and this is good because these are their mistakes. And that is absolutely horrible. And they have this mindset that these people have caused their problems and now it's our problem to fix it. Um, so how does this relate to success? Success is seen as achieving, but our world has turned success into some sort of personal gain. I was really interested to see what youth my age thought of this, so I asked my classmates. <clears throat> and all of their answers, first I asked them, what do they feel society has taught them success is? And their answers really remained very similar, material gain and social status, that you are successful if you have a nice car, a beautiful house, a beautiful wife, gorgeous children who go to the best school. Um, so then I asked them if they could redefine success, because I find that fascinating. If they could redefine success, what would they redefine it as? And their, again, their redefinitions remained very similar. They said that they would flip it on its head instead of material gain, it's spiritual or intellectual gain, constantly chasing towards happiness. Happiness is what came up in every single definition. And of course, even though this flips, its on, flips the material gain on its head um, and turns it into spiritual or happiness gain, um, those definitions are still incomplete because we're still focusing on just the individual. So, if we just ignore the individual and their definition of success and we look at society, we can see that many people's goals as a community, as a society, is to improve the world. With all the global crises that we're facing, um, it's very difficult to stay hopeful and there's great strides forward to change the world. Um, and the end goal of changing the world would literally benefit every person on this earth because it means we're still here and we're still alive and we got through these tests and difficulties and emerged on the other side, somewhat victorious. So my question was, if we achieve that goal, is that not a success? So again, as I've observed, I started to see that many people, including myself, seem to have two competing lifestyles, success for oneself and benefiting the world. And I used with my parents a very, very youth example. <laughs> I said, um, I have this idea of getting new clothing and then I should also be changing the world, but why don't I just get clothing that cuts out environmental impact? And as millennial and sad as that example is, it's just an example of bringing our motives together. So if we combined these two, wouldn't we be constantly striving for success? that no, not only benefits us or me, but everyone. It takes away this inherent selfishness because it's benefiting both me and you. Success, I believe, and my classmates proved it, is a mindset that's passed down. And I started to do more research and realized that serving others actually equals happiness. When we serve others, we develop something called the helper's high. Um, the reward center of our brain is activated and releases oxytocin, which diminishes stress and releases dopamine along with endorphins. Scientifically, serving others makes us happy. We can actually become addicted to serving others. Um, and in this way, we are helping ourselves by reaching that goal that so many want, which is happiness. And we're also improving the world simultaneously. It's the perfect balance of personal and social transformation. So if we taught our youth this definition of success, the achievement of personal and social transformation, would our world not be transformed more efficiently? 
instead of separating the two, me and the rest of the population, we combine them. If we turn this into our definition of success, of course, the problem is it can't just fall onto youth. Yes, youth have many things like I mentioned before, passion, drive, enthusiasm, idealism, insight, and intelligence. But we also possess very high amounts of qualities like lack of motivation, laziness, easy distraction, and insecurity. This speech is a perfect example. My mother had to constantly remind me to write it. <laughs> Even though I was so excited, I couldn't come around to the motivation. So without my dear parents, who knows if I'd be prepared for this today. <laughs> um, and adults, they also have insecurity. Insecurity is one of youth's biggest problems. Adults have experience, political power, more than youth at least, in many cases more self-awareness and self-esteem and experience in supporting others. They are also more respected by the adults around them. So in order to even strive towards this goal or success of helping the world with our actions, we need every stage, not just youth and adults, but children and seniors and everywhere in between. And like I was rambling on about earlier, we can't fight two battles at once. Well, well, we can, and we have been, but it's pointless to divide power into insignificant causes. So how? How do we combine different stages when they're so criticized by one another right now? Um, at a former ABVF conference in Akudo, I was asked the same question in a discussion group. And it took me a while to formulate an answer because it's so easy to speak on about um, a subject and share my opinion and perspective. But if we can't turn those ideas into action, then they remain useless. Another one of my favorite quotes is by Abdul Baha, mm -hmm. and he says, some men and women glory in their exalted thoughts, but if these thoughts never reach the plane of action, they remain useless. Um, and if these uh, thoughts never reach consultation, then they can never reach the plane of action. So the first thing I said in response to this question was adults should open doors. When they're having a conversation of seemingly higher nature and a youth is around, they should have a discussion with that youth. They should ask their ideas and listen intently and try to avoid the easy action of superiority and feeling of superiority, which one can fall into with experience. Um, and listen for potential and for knowledge, then encourage that youth to put those ideas into action. This is a very simple first step. Opening doors can also mean putting youth in contact with those who are more experienced than them or sending them to conferences, um, as I was so lucky to get to do. Um, in this way, you're encouraging the pairing of meaningful discourses with meaningful social transformation. So then, now that I've named the the role of adults in bringing these stages together that also falls on the youth. Uh, another thing that youth are actively learning in this developmental bridge is humility, which is such a difficult concept to grasp. You know, just deciding how you can be humble and still confident at the same time. But this whole speech um, hypes up youth's potential um, and what they can do with the world. But none of that is possible without the knowledge and insight of those around them. This whole talk is pulled knowledge from those older and younger than me who have taught me so much. And as youth, we have to have credible voices. And in order to have credible sources and voices, we need the knowledge and experience of others. It needs to be incorporated. Youth can't walk into a discussion assuming their special role in life will equal the greatest idea or insight. Then their potential is immediately hindered. Youth should, for example, enter a conversation knowing their knowledge is about to be enhanced by the knowledgeable, experienced, credible, and inspiring voices of those adults and seniors around them. And only then can we truly learn. So I know we won't go right into breakout rooms after this, but I did want to say I have a few questions that I will talk about a little later, because if you can't tell, I don't have all the answers. Um, these are just ideas that my childhood, my wonderful parents, and uh, my Baha'i upbringing have kind of grown. But I'd love to hear your insights. Oh, 
you know, the youth have really been in a leadership role with the climate change issue, uh, with uh, Greta Thunberg and the, the millions of, of young people. Can you see any similar role that you could take with respect to the pandemic? A lot of attention has suddenly shifted from climate change to the pandemic. Are there ways that we could also emphasize the constructive role of youth in addressing this other problem and maybe ultimately bringing the two together? I think I have a smaller example of that for sure. That's a wonderful question, thank you. Um, and then um, some online examples as well, but I think just an example within our household, I live here with my two parents and my younger brother, and, um, and we have this huge neighborhood behind our house, and we've interacted with, I think, one of the hundreds of houses that are back there. Um, anyways, Hayden and I really wanted to serve our community, but we were stuck on ideas of how we could do that because it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's an area of means. So we thought that no one there would need help, but um, my parents encouraged us to actually take action, which I don't think we would have anyways, um, if they hadn't have encouraged us. And they helped us plan out the neighborhood and we planned food drives and now we're planning clothing drives. But I think my point is my parents made the idea of service even in a pandemic possible. And even the fact that youth are very connected online and throughout social media. So even I've been seeing at home film festivals to raise awareness for uh, COVID or social media promotions from youth since it's online and youth don't have to be present, which can be an insecurity of theirs. Um, I've also seen youth engaging in classes and courses and trying to better themselves. But of course, again, that brings in that role of the adults that I don't know if I would be doing any of these things if it weren't for my parents' support and nagging a little bit. <laughs> May I? Um, I feel like part of it is just finding ways to open doors for the youth to walk into these big <clears throat> issues, Arthur, um, because otherwise they're not necessarily um, hardwired to think about um, or, or, or imagine that they actually have the power to engage in the way that people like Greta have, um, have, have shown them. So I think for <laughs> youth like Ava or Hayden or other youth on the ground, I think it's people like you and others just saying, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Um, and then I think a youth can imagine walking in the door because somebody believes that they actually mm -hmm. have the credibility to do it. Um, so I do think that's where the intergenerational part comes in is um, the, the learning together in terms of how do we harness the energy that these youth have and how do they engage with um, knowledge or working with context that we might have to to find a voice that's, you know, credible and authentic um, and energized. Mm 